Okay, so the, uh, the, my session, the session I'm supposed to give is to see when we see conflict between Torah and Teva, sometimes we can find confluence provided we look carefully at the Torah and the Teva. And many, much of the, many times, not all, all the times that there is conflict between what the Torah says about the world and what, uh, and what nature seems to say about the world, when it, very often when they, when they seem to con, con, conflict <coughs> is the result of a person knowing a lot of science but not much Torah, talking about Torah, and a person knowing a lot of Torah but not knowing much science talks about science. That's not ignorance, that's stupidity. Ignorance is when you don't know something. But since we just started Brachot in Dafyomi, you will know that within the first about 15 pages, the most important statement, I think, in the entire Talmud is, comes on, and it doesn't have to do with Ramatai, it says, teach your tongue to say, I don't know. And there would be vast less fewer problems in the world if people would teach their tongue to say, I don't know, when you don't know. So, uh, so many, I hope we'll be we'll able to see that many of these conflicts, in fact, can turn out to be confluence, provided we have both the Torah and the Teva. My background is MIT, bachelor's, master's, PhD, seven years in physics staff. I've seen a lot of it, I've worked with a lot of atomic bombs, and anyone who teaches you that you should pray for peace, and that's adequate, has taught you wrong. You should pray as if everything counts on God, and act as if everything counts on you. Because praying for peace is not going to bring peace, as we've seen for the last 2,000 years. This is as close as I can get to how smart he is. Um, <laughs> Do you need a <laughs> No, I don't know. I don't get tell PowerPoint to be okay. Perfect. Well, guys, I heard this speech probably since the first time I heard it was in Cleveland some, uh, a long time ago. <coughs> very long time, 25 years ago. Could be. And not the same speech, but uh, something like it. When it first came out, you know, when no. it first came out, you're kind of bestseller. Um, guys, I, I bring it back every year, and every year I get a little bit more open to him. So keep, keep trying to keep it, it's a lot, but it's a real good thing at the end. Kind of <laughs> no. <laughs> Hui! That's it, you just got the big bang. Uh, <laughs> What? Is that? Yeah? There we go, that's right. I don't have a PhD. Yeah, huh. Okay. So, uh, okay, so with that background, we try to keep a few, a few, the main, the two basic topics I'm going to talk about will be uh, a bit about evolution and a bit about the age of the universe. So, the, the, what the, uh, is that visible? Is there, there's a lot of light here, but can you see what's on the board? Yeah. And so, anyone speak Italian in the group? Italian speakers? Yeah? No. So, there's a book on the desk there that says Bibbia. No one, anybody, it's Italian for the Hebrew word Bible. So, we got here Galileo. The original etching doesn't have it. My, one of my grandchildren put it, put that on here. But it's Galileo looking through a telescope, but on his desk he's got a Bible. He didn't see a conflict between what he saw on the telescope and what he read in the Bible. So that's just the idea of Torah and science. One truth from two vastly different perspectives. And that's pretty much what we're going to talk about today. Now if I can get this to work, we move forward. So just to, not a lot about the evolution, but just some basic facts uh, that, that might be interesting. One of the interesting facts, I think, is that all, all life, whether you're a bacterium, a pine tree, a human, or an elephant, has the identical genetic code. Nature got it right the first time around. One language, one, the DNA that you've got in you is the same as the DNA that a bacterium has, that a pine tree has, it's all the same. So that we have a common ancestor, and when people worry about chimpanzees, we've got a common ancestor probably in who knows what, but in any event. So the same alphabet that in your DNA writes out to be you, that same alphabet is used to write out a pine tree to be a pine tree and a bacterium to be a bacterium. It's identical. 
which is interesting because when people try to record information, humans didn't get it universally uh, correct the first time. The, the English alphabet is vastly different from the Hebrew alphabet and totally, and the Greek alphabet and the, the Russian alphabet and the languages are different. But nature has it all the same. One language, one alphabet to spell every form of life. And that is so phenomenally complicated that, in fact, we had a conference here about two months ago in Jerusalem where, where, where we went through numbers of probability of these things happening by chance. And none of it, the data are overwhelming. There is no possibility that the complexity of the life that we have to see in the genetic code arose by, by random reaction. So what is the answer? that allows you to, to get away from this. Well, I'm just going to walk over here because I, it's not on these slides, it's, but I want to show you one slide that is really pretty interesting because it is the major, it's the major argument that you don't need God to get the world the way it is. It is probably the strongest argument, maybe the only argument, and that, to get a world that is so perfect that that you can just have things have happened by chance. And that argument is, if I can ever find the slide, I was using it. Yeah, you won't be able to see all of it, you get the general picture. This is the most widely sold science journal in the world. It's dangerous to read because it's not peer-reviewed, so the editor tells you whatever the editor wants. But it's Scientific American. It's, it's, it is by as easy a factor of 10, maybe 100, the most widely sold science journal in on in in, in all languages, and it's cheap. That's why it's so so, because it's not peer reviewed. Everyone knows what peer reviewed is? Because if you're going to get scientific data, you have to get it from peer reviewed journals. Peer review means I was, I was back at MIT, so I'd, write, I'd do an experiment, write it up, I send it for publication, not in a journal like this, where the editor decides what's right or wrong, but, the, but in a journal where the, where the editor takes off my name and sends it out to my peers, my equals in the scientific community, and they read it not knowing that I wrote it, and then they write back and say it's garbage or it's good. If it's garbage, it doesn't get published, or it's good, it does get published. That doesn't happen with Scientific American. It doesn't happen with the other journal for the new scientists, so if you, or it doesn't happen with Time Magazine, and it doesn't happen with the New York Times Science section. So if you're getting your science from those types of sources, realize that you're getting prejudiced science. And here is probably the most extraordinary example of the prejudice of, of science. It's clearly, all, all, all calculations show that the probability of random reactions producing anything that resembles life come out to be about zero. The like is like, the numbers are usually like one chance in ten to the hundredth to one ten chance in ten. Ten to the, ten to the power of a hundred. That means a hundred, ten times ten to a hundred zeros after. Those numbers don't exist in the, in the universe and chance. So what's the answer? Well, they give the answer, since a lot of scientists still think it's chance, and here it is. Infinite Earths and parallel universes really exist. See, if there's an infinite number of parallel universes, then most of them will be losers, and a few will be winners, and obviously we're in one of the winners. Not because we're special, just because the only place there are people is where there's a winner. Okay, and many of the winners might not even have persons, but obviously we're the winners. And the argument that there are infinite numbers of Earths in parallel universes, each universe has its own law of nature, not galaxies, not stars, universes. What's the argument that we have? It's really phenomenal. Here's the argument. I realize you can't see it. I apologize. You should have it on the slide, but I took it off of brevity, but I see it was a mistake. I have to ask the grand one of my grandchildren to put it back on. I can't think of how to work these things. Anyway, what's the evidence? Cosmologists, those are the guys and gals that look about the stars, cosmologists infer, not know, but infer the presence of other parallel universes by scrutinizing the properties of our universe. And these properties include, and they list a whole list of, of the laws of nature, these properties were established by random processes during the birth of our universe, yet they have exactly the values that sustain life. That suggests the existence of other universes with other values of nature that don't sustain life. And of course, it's, it's embarrassing to hear that stupid logic. But that's called stupidity. The fact that our universe is perfect is the strongest argument for other universes 
that are not perfect. The, if you're in the field, you know the name Bernard Carr. Carr. Bernard Carr, the, the, in the field, the world famous cosmologist from England writes, if you don't want God, you have to have multiple universes. And there are no data that support the fact that there are multiple universes. So the, the numbers for the likelihood of randomness producing life is pretty slim. In fact, it's, it's zero unless there are a vast number of other, other, uh, universe. Now, I gotta say something that bothers me, okay? So I will tell you. If you're at home, you wouldn't put your feet on the chair, in the chair. Okay. Quotola. So, so first of all, all of evolution has this universal system. Unlike humans, which have English and French and Greek and all different languages and all alphabets. We have one alphabet and one language. But what's even, what's extraordinary is the amount of information in every cell of your body. Every cell has two, approximately two meters of this double helix. Two meters in every cell. So supposing you took out, supposing you took out all the DNA in any one of our bodies here and strung it one after the other. Any guesses for where it would reach? Any thoughts? Inside the, entire the what? The, the earth, you mean? Or what? Yes. Yeah, actually much more. It would be, it would reach from here to, to, Neptune, to, to Pluto and back and out again. If, if the amount of, if you have in your body, if you ring it, string it together, would give you 500 round trips to the sun. Earth, sun, earth, sun. That's all in your body. When you think about the compacting of, of information, if all the information in every library in the world, every, all types, books, videos, whatever, all the information were put into the language of DNA, all the information of every library in the world would fit on the head of a pin. Not the point, that's too small, but the head of a pin, everything. So the compactness of the information is overwhelming. and. Uh, and somehow it got started. The light era of being, it doesn't prove there's a God, but it absolutely does prove we have no idea how it started. There are no data that support an argument for the origin of life. Let me get clear. Anyone who argues that tells you how life started, they're even, in the famous scientist Feynman said, they're either naive or stupid. There are no, there's no understanding of how life started. To sustain life, the laws of nature are perfect. But to start life, it's a totally different story. You've got rocks and water. It's more than just rocks and water. It's, it's that, it's that the scientific community actually accepts the fact that life started with a Big Bang creation. This diagram here is, uh, is totally from NASA. Every word except the age of the universe is for, straight off the web. You type in NASA for NASA, National Space Authority, and then WMAP, and you get, and you get the, uh, and you get this diagram. I have the diagram. It hasn't changed in either. Printed out my sheets here <coughs> from 10 years ago. Hasn't changed one bit. The age of the universe is zeroed in to about 14 billion years, but the wording of the diagram is exactly. And you'll notice that at the creation of the universe, it's a burst of energy. You realize that, that the, what NASA says, which is the major scientific understanding of the universe, is that the Big Bang didn't produce chopped and chopped liver. The Big Bang produced a burst of energy. And that energy became alive. It doesn't really matter whether it took 14 billion years or 14 minutes or 14 days or whatever. That light beams could become alive is a given in the scientific community because this is the only physical creation according to science. The Big Bang, and that's even something new. Since 60 years ago, the understanding of the scientific community was that the universe was eternal. Now we have a fact that the, the science agrees with the opening sentence of the Bible there was a creation. You realize, 60 years ago, science assumed the first sentence of the Bible was wrong. Not in no creation of the universe, it was eternal. Now we understand, thanks to the work of Arnold Penzias and Robert Wilson and hundreds of other scientists, that there was a creation. But that, cre that creation brought into being energy. Einstein showed that E and M can change, right? The famous equation, what is it, E equals something or other, what is it equal? 
equals mc squared. You know, so the e and the m can change. They're interchangeable. But that e that changes to m is still energy. I mean, sometimes we think that the energy disappears and becomes matter, but that's not that is the case. The first of the nuclear weapons I worked with was the U 235 weapon. That's the same stuff that's being used over there, 2,000 kilometers towards the east. But it wasn't that the U 235 metal now had to become energy. It was always energy in the form of a metal. Just like water is always hydrogen and oxygen. You drink water, well, you can't be it, glug, glug, glug. But you drink it hydrogen and oxygen. And when you look at, at anything, <coughs> anything that you see, you're literally looking at the light of creation in the form of a chair or you or whatever. And when those bombs went off, it wasn't that the U-235 metal suddenly had to be reconstructed. It was always energy in the form of a metal. And then when you handle it properly or improperly, depending on your view, you get the energy to come out of it, or a few percent of it. Most of it remains inside the inside held as the, as the atoms. Okay, anyway, but I do want to say something that <coughs> for those guys that are interested in this at all, if you see that the beginning of the quantum fluctuation for the creation, we have a video <coughs> that web wide now is approaching five million views, which I always say is amazing because I'm not playing the guitar on there, so I don't see how they get five million views. We call it Proof of God in five minutes. I urge you, it's worth watching. It takes five minutes and 28 seconds. Some of the hijacked versions call it Relief of God in five minutes. But you don't get, you don't get four or five million views if it's, if it's, you know, junk. And it only deals with the first millimeter of that diagram by NASA. How the universe was created from absolutely nothing physical. And it turns out, you've seen that diagram, and that's what made, the, what made that video powerful is totally based on this diagram from NASA. There's no Bible talk in it until the, until, until the very end. That NASA's description of the creation of the universe is a spot-on description of the creation of the universe from Kazal. It's exact. It's so much frightening, actually. So the, uh, so the, and the, the, uh, the diagram brings NASA, and only at the end is it we show, we show how it's essentially a mirror image. It's a direct image of, of, NASA, of science. So what, that, what the diagram you're looking at here is called the age of the universe, <coughs> once you get past the creation. The ver it's a timeline. Each vertical line is another billion years. There are about 14 of them. The oval at the end, the oval at the end is to show, is to show that the universe is expanding in all directions. That WMAP, that satellite at the far side, is the satellite that mapped these data and got a couple of people the Nobel Prize. And the specks of light there are, are energy gradually becoming matter and then becoming, you know, lighting up as galaxies and stars. And we exist out on that far end on the oval. That's, that's our time. All the billions of years go back further. It's a timeline. One thing you'll notice is it's not a, uh, it's not a mistake in the photograph, but the rate of expansion is actually increasing. It says accelerated expansion. It's a mistake to call it dark energy. I don't know why these, these scientific years have fallen into that trap. A better word from dark energy would be Ogilvy, or maybe Zugalvy, possibly Bugalvy or Bogalvy. So we should be meaningless words, because we have no idea if it's energy. But by labeling energy, you put in your head as if we understand it. There is no understanding what's going on, but it's a force. We should just say a force bringing a, a accelerated expansion. And originally, in the early part, of the uh, diagram, when the galaxies were close together, so this increased rate didn't matter, didn't show up because it was linear. But once the galaxies get further and further apart, then the then the pressure of space becomes stronger than the gravitational pull of the galaxies. Galaxies themselves are not being torn apart. We're not being pushed away from the sun, the Earth, because the gravity of the Earth to the sun is stronger than the push of space expanding, and that's for all the stars in the galaxy. But from galaxy to galaxy, where the distances are great, the stretching of space actually moves the galaxies further apart. And that's the accelerated expansion. <clears throat> and eventually, it was interesting. So we live in a really special time, but for the first time, these data are only like 10 years old. The, for the first time, we can understand a lot about the universe. One thing for sure is that we can see other galaxies. You know, if, suppose... So it took about 14 billion years as we measure time to get from the creation 
to people that can make telescopes and make satellites, etc. But had it taken 28 billion years, twice the amount of time, we wouldn't be able to make the calculations. Because by then the universe would be so expanded that we would not be able to see any other galaxies. We can only see the other galaxies now because it's still relatively close. But as this accelerated expansion increases, the distance will become so great between each of the galaxies that we will think we're the only galaxy in the universe, and then we would get the Bible, and then we would see six days, and then we would say, well, this doesn't make sense, how can, etc., etc. We now, we live now in a time where we can see other galaxies and make the calculations that let us understand the Bible makes a lot of sense. And you don't, even if you don't want to take it on faith, you can take it on data. So, uh, anyway, so the question we'll deal with now at the moment is, well, I want to jump back though to evolution, because I jumped, I left out one part, then I'll get, then we get how old is the universe based on science, 14 billion based on, based on Bible and the ages, 6,000 years. But, but, but the evolution, what I should, what he should have pointed out, uh, was what? I don't remember, it's something important, but, uh, anyway. The, uh, uh, what was I aiming at to say about the evolution? Oh yeah, we've had, we've, the difficulty with evolution, in fact, the class I gave just a few hours ago, uh, someone asked about evolution and can we possibly think it has, has any relevance to the Torah. The, diff the difficulty with evolution is the intrinsic meaning that has been forced onto the word evolution. I've worked with four professional evolutionists over the over the last about decade and a half. Not all together, but separate times. And all four gave exactly, once you take your foot up the chair, you wouldn't put on your, on your mother's table at home, you don't do it here. Okay. So it's called Torah. The, uh, the, uh, the, the, the difficult to word evolution is that the definition definition that's given is random mutations in this in the sex line produces differences in the in the progeny coming off and sometimes and and some and some of the mutations make some baby lines stronger and some baby lines weaker some baby cheats are faster some baby cheats are slower so that'd be the first stage the second stage would be strong lions kill and eat weak lions that's why there are not a lot of lions in the world not hunters lions kill lions and Fast cheetah get more food than slow cheetah for the for the for the project for the children. So the second stage of evolution, as it's defined, is 100% not random. That is to say, fast cheetah get four, more food than slow cheetah. Strong lions kill weak lions. The problem with the definition of evolution is in the first stage, random mutations that make these changes. The Torah has no problem with mutations. There's a whole section in Vayikra, Leviticus, the third book of the, the third book of the Bible that talks about mutations in the person that served the person that served in the temple, and those are mutations can't serve because they're, because they're physically not perfect. They're, they're fine human beings, but just like the offerings have to be perfect, the people bringing the offerings have to be perfect. And those mutate those those koanim were. When living there with mutations, it's from the from the orphans, but they can't bring them. Because the orphans have to be perfect, the people's bringing them. So the mutations that made those people not perfect, that's not a problem for the Torah. It talks about them. So the Torah has no problem with mutations producing some baby lions strong and some weak, some cheetah fast and slow. What the Torah has a problem with is the word random. There are no data that can show you that the mutations are random. I will, I don't have, if any of you guys are taking AP in biology or praying to go into biological sciences, under no circumstances, and I say this completely seriously because we know people this happen to, never challenge your instructor when he or she tells you the mutations are random. And never say, well, show me that the mutations are random. There are no data that shows that they are random. In fact, they usually, the mathematics shows that they're not random. But never do that because either you won't get your degree or you won't get a job. Because you won't get a good letter of recommendation, which you'll never see. I'm not, I, I say that absolutely seriously. You cannot challenge your teachers in, in these things in which it's their Bible that it's all random. You, and 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 you, you it's terrible to have to say that, but it's kind of like you know, 
in America, but you're afraid to wear a keeper now. You have to wear, wear a baseball cap because you might get beaten up. The same, exactly the same phenomenon. You know, you have to hide. You have to hide what your beliefs are. But that's the, that's what the world. That's what that's what science is about now. There are rules that you have to accept. So you may know, and you can show mathematically that they can't be random. But you can't challenge a teacher because if that teacher is vindictive, you will you will suffer anyway. So so the da- so there are no data that support the mutations of random. But that's what you're still taught, and that's the problem. So I, so did life using that definition? Did life evolve? From the simple to the complex? No. Did life develop from the simple to the complex? I think absolutely yes. Because that's what the Torah says. First is for animal life. You get six sentences. You get animal life. You get life in the waters, life in the land, mammalian, human, you know, you get a few sentences. There's no information given, but the flow is exactly what we see in the fossil record. You see, first you see animal life in the waters, then you see animal life on the land, then you see, then you see life, life, and then it becomes more and more complex. So the few sentences that are given in the Torah, which is pretty amazing, you don't take it for granted. And we're talking about a text 3,500 years ago. So it's not like the people knew this stuff, you know, having first on the street. Okay. So that's, that's my understanding for evolution. There's a lot in you, 500 round trips to the sun. It's pretty good. And the same language that Spells you, spells a pine tree and an and a, a, uh, elephant and a bacterium. How old is the universe? Science says about 14 billion years. And the way that we get those data, we, I'm, not, I'm not a cosmologist, but the way cosmologists get those data is they look into space and they get light coming from space to us. And that light coming from space is stretched by the stretching of space. And that's the wavelength becomes stretched out. We actually possible to measure the stretching of the wavelength. So it turns out the further the galaxy is from the Earth, the more it is, the more the light wave is stretched. And when you put all those data back to unstretch the wavelength, because as the wave swims through space that's stretching, as the space stretches, the wavelength is stretched. And so what it does is it turns blue light into red. It's called the red shift. Red is a long wavelength. Blue is a short wave. They're all short, but red is longer than blue. Okay, and sometimes it gets so stretched you can't see it, but you can still measure it. So if you take all those data and unstretch them, it takes about 14 billion years to get back to the original shape of the light wave. So that's how the 14 billion years are going to be. The age of the universe less than 6,000 years is interesting because for some reason, the Torah wants us to know the age of the universe from its point of view. I mean, you have to think of some things. You just don't take the wording for granted. Why is the Torah bother telling us that after Adam and Eve have Cain and Abel, and Cain has murdered Abel, and Abel is, ex- is exiled, that Adam and Eve hang around for 130 years before I have the next kid? Do I really care? Who cares? And then, I, and that's for Seth, and it's Seth 105 years. Why did, why did the Torah break my head telling me all these numbers? And if you take these numbers, but never take it, never just take them, stum. Look at them and see why you're being told them, because every act in the Torah has significance. Why does the Torah want us to have all these numbers? We know that it wants us to build up the numbers to get some kind of a calendar, because there's two sets of calendars. Adam, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. Cain murders Abel. It's all in chapter 4. Abel is, Abel's dead. Cain is exiled. But then we're told all the things that Cain did. But no ages are given. His progeny did this, that, and the other thing. We come to the next chapter 5, and then Adam and Eve have their third kid, Seth, and then we're told three figures. Seth 130 years to Enosh, Enosh 105 years, you know, etc. Uh, Adam and Eve 130 years to Seth, and Seth 110. Yeah. Why are we given those names? But the, the Torah wants it to use those numbers. It's clear, because when it uses the number for, for Cain, there are no data given. Why? Because Cain's line is a dead end. It doesn't continue. The, the line that goes to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob comes through Seth. So those data are significant. So the, uh, so the Torah wants it. I mean, just examples of stuff that we probably all, you know, we're always told every word is important. But let's see, we come out of Egypt, split the sea, plagues, etc. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. And of course, what the people say to God is, well, what have you done for me lately? 
He gave me this manna stuff, but it tastes like oatmeal. I want to have oatmeal every day. I want a good meal. Even though it totally tastes like everything, but clearly they didn't because they weren't happy with it. They want to have meat. So what did he get to eat? Anybody know the Bible enough to know that? What? They get what? Quail. Why does the Bible tell us quail? You ever think about that? Yeah, that's how they get them. But why does the Bible tell us quail? I mean, the area where they are, which is coming out and it's going to be coming up like the Sinai, that area, is the bird watching area of the world. Every season of winter to summer, summer to winter, millions, hundreds of millions of birds migrate. So why quail? Well, I'll tell you. Next time, for those that are interested, not now, but afterwards, type in quail poison. Quail poison. And you'll turn exactly why God gave us quail. So every word is important. So it's worth looking at that. When, when Jacob, when Jacob has to, ha, with, with Levon, has to get, uh, and when you, in, when you get that big list of the, of the different publications, you know, these are not Bible publications, these are science publications, but make sure you look at the one that goes back 2,000 years to the Roman Legion. You'll get in the list of, of, of references to the poisonous of quail, and when it's poisonous, guess when? Migration season, spring. When do we come out of Egypt? Spring, etc. But make sure, what you do want to do is look at the, at the one for the Roman Legion, it's really amazing. Uh, how many soldiers were dying from eating quail. They were forbidden finally to eat quail. It's an amazing, amazing phenomenon. Jacob, just to show some of the things that are, that are significant, that raise some interest anyway. The, uh, Jacob has to start getting spotted sheep, right? Because he's made this deal with his, his, his tricky father-in-law. So he puts sticks in the water. He peels them. Anybody know, you know this story? Peels sticks to get, make the animals make. You guys have that stuff or not? Yeah? Yeah? You know what's so strange there? The Torah tells us the names of the sticks. It tells us the names of the trees. I mean, do I really care what tree Jacob used? So look up the trees, not on Bible references, look up the trees, look up the nature of the saps, and you will find that the saps from those trees that are listed are, guess what? What would you think? He wants them to mate, so what would you think the saps would be? What? Aphrodisia. Yeah. yeah. That's why every word, don't make it into a joke, that's why every word in the Torah is important, but not one of you had looked it up before. Interesting, huh? I wonder if there's Zed, if he'd looked it up, maybe in the previous book. Anyway, uh, it's, it's so every time you see something that seems superfluous, to look it up, because it is telling you something. It's telling you some other text. Okay, anyway, so the Torah gives us all these ages, and the Bible, based on the ages given the Hebrew Bible, plus the kings, queens, set to the presidents, gives us less than 6,000 years. So we got 14 billion years based on the stretching of space. We got less than 6,000 years from the uh, queens. And what I'm, gonna do, what I'm doing now is using the Ramban, Nachmanides day, con concepts, and I just put the numbers in. The Ramban just led me by, literally, like that, to make the calculation. I just was the lucky guy. To make to put the numbers in. Okay, so here's that diagram again. Big Bang creation. Big Bang. The Big Bang is good. And by the way, the term the Big Bang does not say what made the Big Bang go bang. It's just a secular way of saying creation. Whereas if you're a secular person, if you have to say creation, God forbid it sounds like the creator and it's the last thing we're going to talk about, so it's called the Big Bang. So the Big Bang is good news, actually. It's the discovery that the Bible got the first sentence right. That was a big pill for swallow, for science to swallow. So we're out here on this oval out here at the end of the earth, and we've got a creation from the, from the beginning. Let's see what happens next. <coughs> so we have a two-part calendar, right? Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah marks the beginning of the, and this says 5779, I haven't gotten around to change it. I don't think my grandchildren change it. 5780. So, the Torah, we add up all those ages in the Bible, come to the kings and queens, we get to a number of 5780, 5779 from last year, okay? Science looks at the data and says 14 billion years. 
But of course, the 5779 or 5780 starts with uh, Adam and Eve, right? That that when when the first of the humans appear on Earth. The calendar begins, which makes sense because before that time there are no humans. So we have a calendar that is that is split into two parts: the creation of the universe to Adam, and then Adam up to the up to the uh, to the present. So, and the switch that we have is the neshama, the soul of human life. And you guys should make it, there's only a couple of gals in the room, but you guys you should take, keep it in your head that when you get married, I wish I'd known this, we're married way over 43 years, but I would have been, the first 20 would have been smoother, let's put it that way. If I'd realized that all the divine inputs into the world are feminine. What's the name for the soul of animals? Right, nefesh, feminine. Soul of humans, neshama, feminine. Indwelling of God? Shechina, feminine. And in, in Proverbs, in Mishra, we read that God creates the universe with Hachmat, Luna, Vedat, the origin of Chabad, they're all feminine. All the inputs are feminine. Keep that in your mind, guys, when you, when you get married. You'll have a happier life. Or you'll have a happy life, put it that way. Anyway, we just stuck in the Shema and Eve, but, you know, the woman, but we got, I hope I have one also. Anyway, so we have this split where the calendar begins with the humans, and we have those years leading. If humans are such a big deal, then why didn't they change the world? And they did. And that's what any of you guys are from, 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 from the UK, I urge you. You go to a British Museum, and this is a photograph of, of a plaque that's on the wall of the British Museum in the Mesopotamian wing. It says the earliest cities, and it, this is from it. One of the most significant advances taking place in the merchants of the city, large towns before, but about 3500 BCE, there was a sudden change. See that date? 3500, they don't say E, obviously. 3500 BCE is 5500 years ago. It's an exact match with the Neshama and the first of the humans. It's an exact match. The first humans appear about 5780, whatever that number comes out to be approximately. It takes a few hundred years to get enough humans around. And what do you end up with? The first cities. And it's interesting, one of the students pointed out one of the first Acts that Cain does, after he's exiled, he builds a city. It's interesting. That Cain builds a city. But the, but the dating is extraordinary. 5,500 years ago. That's the British Museum. The most important museum worldwide for this part of the world. It gives a date for the change in civilization. Now, supposing it is said not 5,500 years ago, but 6,500 years ago, or 7,500. The change should have taken with farming. Farming goes back 10 to 11,000 years. Because if, if population explosion was a reason, farming changed the world. Before that, it was hunter-gatherer. Hunter-gatherer means small families. Because how many kids can you carry when you... There's whole books written about this. When you, when you follow the herd. But farming is sedentary. You have big families. And you start having big families. But no population, and, and a population explosion, in fact, also. But no cities. No cities until there are humans. Why is that? Why wasn't it that if, if farming goes back 10,000 years, so let's say 1,000 years in space, so 9,000 years ago this should have happened, or 8,000, or 7,000, or 6,000, let it sink into your head. Cities, large cities in, in large numbers appear exactly spot on as the Torah would expect. A few hundred years after the first of the humans, you had more humans, <coughs> and then you have cities. Because before you had, before you had humans in the summer, if you didn't look like me, smell like me, or talk like me, I had just a dinner, roasted or boiled. I asked thee because it was a dog eat dog world. There were no humans; there were animals. As my Maimonides talks about them in the Guide to the Flex. Animals in the sh same shape and intelligence as humans, but they're animals. But they had the same shape and intelligence, the Ramban, the guy for the perplexed. So you couldn't have a city. And the curator, I say literally, with the fullest meaning of the word, thank God, the curator was there. I spoke with him. I asked him about the date. And then I asked him about the Tower of Jericho. The Tower of Jericho goes back 10,000 years. So I said, well, what about that for a city? He said, no, no, that wasn't a city. That was a marker for a clan 
saying, this is my land and I farm it, stay off. Farming introduced land ownership. Before that, we were searching for the herd. Farming changed the world sociologically, but not spiritually. So you couldn't have a city, even though there were more and more people, because they didn't have a neshama. They couldn't, you couldn't have, until the neshama is, and the first humans, you couldn't have a neshama. You couldn't have a city. Because you had to be for my clan. Suddenly, humans come, and you can have, you can room here, different types of people, etc. <coughs> so, and that's the British Museum. I urge you, if you make the mistake of leaving Israel, to uh, go to the museum. British Museum. Anyway, so we have this calendar. Creation, up to Adam and Eve. It says five and a half days, not even six days. It's only five and a half days. The Talmud said Adam is created halfway through the sixth day. And even if the Talmud didn't say that, if you go to Genesis chapter 1 and look at the sixth day where Adam appears, Adam is spot on. Count the number of verses in day number six. Adam is spot on halfway through. So that may be the source of the Talmud telling us that Adam was created halfway through the sixth day. But anyway, at five and a half days before you have humans, and then bingo, we have humans. The Torah says more like 14 billion years. My guess is they're both correct. Because there's one author for the both. Why should there be a conflict? There's one author for the Torah, one author, the same author for nature. So immediately what's important is the two major commentators on the wording of the Torah shoot down the idea that the days were long periods of time. There is no ancient commentary that says they were long periods of time. It's the easiest Rashi in all shots. Yom, Kuf, Dalet, Sha'ot. Day, 24 hours. The Ramban goes even further. Not mine, the Ramban goes further. So it's not only 24 hours, but like the Sheikh, like the six days of our work week. So you can't say the hours are different. So the days are 24 hours each. <coughs> That's a given. Here we have the slide giving 14 billion years. But get out of your head the baby answer that the days were the long periods of time. Because they weren't. And what's interesting is, is that these two major commentators felt we had to say that. That's probably because the sun is not mentioned until the fourth day, I would guess. So what's the answer? Nachmanides gives us the answer, and I just put the numbers in. The rest was, he, he literally gives us the answer, but not with numbers, because he didn't have them. He may have had the numbers, but he didn't speak about them. And he, he, he directs us to the idea of how the days are numbered. At the end of each day of Genesis chapter 1, there is evening and there is morning, Yom Echad, one day. Evening and morning, Yom Sheni, second day. Yom Shishi, <coughs> third day. Why the change in the form of numbers, he asked. Second day, Thursday, fourth day, fifth day, the sixth day, give me a first day. Why does the text say day one? Why doesn't it say a first day? So well, I assure you the Ramban knew Rashi, one day, one God, but the Ramban said to talk to us how the world is put together. And he said the text says day one, and could not write a first day on the first day because there had not yet been a second day. So we all know that from the World Wars. The world, in world, in, during the First World War, besides the pessimists, no one called the First World War the First World War, the First World War. The pessimists were correct, but no one else called it the First World War. They called it the Great War, the war to end all wars. I fought in the First Lebanese War. None of us not me and not my four buddies that didn't come back from the First Lebanese War, said we're fighting in the First Lebanese War. Now, I'd like an answer. Why, when I was fighting in the First Lebanese War, didn't I say I was fighting in the First Lebanese War? No, why? Because there wasn't, exactly, there wasn't the second yet. Now I have to say the first. The text writes day one because there wasn't yet a second day. And that's the whole answer. Paul answered totally to the problems of the age of the universe. And what and and what's interesting is <coughs> here is it why uh, first day, why why day one not a first day, the second before time is created, so this good. See, now if the Torah was seeing time not from the beginning looking forward, but from Sinai for the six days of Genesis, well by the time they get to Sinai, they'd been almost nine hundred thousand days. So by the time they get to Sinai, if the Torah were looking back from Sinai on these six days, 
it would have written as a first day, because there'd been 893,520 second days. So the Torah writes day one because the Torah does not see time for the six days of Genesis, Genesis from Sinai looking back. It sees, it sees time from the beginning looking forward. What is the perception of time from the Bible? The perception of time from the Bible is that the Torah sees time from the beginning looking forward. It sees five and a half days. We look back and we measure 14 billion years. And the the understanding is totally based on the fact that the universe starts at a small point and it spans out, exactly as the diagram says. But the Rav Tan Kuma talked about this also in the, about 1900 years ago. He talks about it in the Midrash that he brings down in, in Sav, I, we're, it's really worth looking at it, in Sav, and it's chapter 8 of Leviticus, about verse 2 or 3 or 4, right there, you can find it. The, the Tanhuma then. It's really worth seeing because it's such an insight that you know, he brings it down that the universe starts at a small point and expands out. And that's the whole answer to the age of the universe. Because if the universe was static, it wouldn't matter if the Torah sees time from the beginning, from anywhere, from Timbuktu or Canarsi or Moscow. It really wouldn't matter. But the fact that the universe is expanding is totally the result of changes in the perception of time. And there are two perspectives of time here. The six days of Genesis that's listed as a unit, the Yavhi Edavi Voker is a couplet that appears nowhere else. Evening morning, evening and morning are mentioned, but that couplet, the Yavhi Edavi Voker, appears nowhere else in Tanakh. At least I haven't found any place. Okay, small point starts out, no substance expands. Okay. <coughs> so. What does this all lead to? Well, it leads to the fact that we have a view of time looking from the beginning, looking forward, and a view of time looking back. Why is it significant? So here's a quick thought experiment. Got a galaxy over here, and you just have to walk away from the microphone. That big galaxy over here is a big, big, beautiful galaxy. It's so far away, it takes billions of light years, billions of years rather, for the light to reach us. Billions of years. So we got this big galaxy, we got a telescope here watching it. And it's real interesting, but we don't see it lifetime, the light has to come to us. So on the galaxy, on the galaxy, a star explodes, supernova. Light goes out in all directions. Just talk about the light coming to our telescope over here. It's the same in all directions. Boom. Exploding star. Light travels for a week, and then another star explodes. <coughs> wow. Two supernovae separate by a week. Now, if this burst stood still, this would catch it, because it's all speeding. But obviously, they're all moving. But as they move through time and space to reach us, now they're separated, it's a week later, first burst, second burst, one week later. But now as they move through time and space, space is stretching. So the distance between them gets larger and larger and larger. Let's say the universe takes so long, the universe doubles in size. So the first burst hits our telescope, the second burst doesn't reach our telescope till two weeks later. Ah, so my understanding is two weeks for those two events. I go, I want to know what happened back there in history. So I call for an astronomer, what, you know, how, how much space stretch. I go back in time mathematically, and as I go back mathematically, the universe compacts, 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 and the two weeks become one week. It's the same, it can be used this way, of the, of the wavelengths of light, it's all, it's all, all the same. When you extrapolate information back in time and expanding universe, time becomes compressed, and that's the whole key to the age of the universe. I, uh, I, and that's Nachmanides' insight of day one, that the Torah sees time from the beginning when the universe was small. The Ramban knew the Tanchuma, knew that these under, it comes from the book of Isaiah chapter 40. Small point expands out. So we have two point, two views, one looking from the beginning, looking forward, one looking back. The Ramban then makes a, a deal, the Chadet is it, he sharpens it. Time is created at the creation, that's his time there. But the clock only begins when matter is formed. Because although time went by between time and the time and the matter, as is shown there, that squishing of time, hundred thousandth of a second, nothing recorded time. Only, there is no stable matter. It's only at that point M, matter, that's, that, that the first of the protons freezes out, let us say, from the, uh, from the energy. Before that time, there's nothing, no stable matter to record time. 
It's a small point, but it, it allows us to make the calculation. So we have two point, we have two calculations here. One looking from looking back from point B, that's us, and where we live in those. That's the reality. But why would we the perception of the Bible? We don't live in Bible time, we live in human time. And the equation that shows the relationship between the perception of time and A to B, I, it's only two months now that I ever have the courage to put this equation on the board because sometimes, you know, it turns people crazy. If you go to my website, it's explained in great detail. Every, every, every item of that equation is explained on the website, my uh, GeraldSchroeder.com. Anyway, so uh, that equation is an integral equation because it's not linear and it's non-linear. That just means it's not a straight line. Nothing, nothing fancy word in there. And that, that gives us these two perspectives of time. And when you average out that A over B, that relationship between the ratio of how we see time for us at B versus how you see time at A, that relationship, oops, wrong, wrong button, wrong button. Hang on, let's see if I can get over here. That relationship comes out to be, uh, uh, 900 billion. In that equation, in the equation there, that lead, leads to this 900 billion. If you go to my website, you'll see how you get it. There is not a single Bible number. It is totally NASA data. And that equation has zero Torah in it. It just happens to be describing the development of the universe. And that number that comes from it is 900 billion. 900 billion and it's unitless. What it means is, if I had 900 billion seconds worth of history from point B, it'd look like one second from A, from the, the Torah point of view. 900 billion hours looks like one hour, 900 billion days. When the ratio is 900, the billions drop off, and now we have something with 14. We, have, we see 14 billion years. I wonder why it's not working, but it's not. There we go. Divided by 900 billion. So the zeros all drop out. It's interesting. End up with 14 years divided by 900. There's no, there is no Bible data on the board. This is, these are NASA numbers. Okay. Yeah. They can get it, they can get it, that's why, you just go to my website thing, you know, I pass our cards around. So it comes out to be, comes out to be 15 thousandths of a year, 14 years, the billions drop off, 9, 9, 15 thousandths of a year, somehow I keep getting the wrong numbers here. And that comes out to be five and a half days. The fact that the science, the fact that the science comes to match it, isn't a trick, but that's what made the book on the bestseller list for an entire year. If it were a trick, the difficulty is I could never get this published in a, in a science journal, even though the numbers are pure science. But that's the same reason why you don't want to challenge your teacher that's teaching you biology, says it's random, don't do it because you will pay for it with your profession. Yeah. Why can't I? Why? Oh, because if, if, for the same reason, for the same reason that the proof that, that you got here by randomness is because you're perfect. And the other universes must not be perfect. For the same convoluted reason that is this, you don't get it published. It's just the way it is. You have to realize that there are certain prejudices in the world, and if you don't think there are, we're your keeper and walk through Paris and see how far you get. Yeah. Because, you know why? I asked, I asked Nobel Prize winner uh, Stephen Weinberg, Jew, magnificent human being, brilliant beyond understanding. He's a theoretical physicist. I'm applied physics. There's a difference in intelligence there, okay? So, and, 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 he's just not interested. It doesn't interest them. If you're not interested in Torah already, most houses in America, most Jewish houses in America probably don't have a Bible. It just doesn't interest them. What interests them is the next program on TV. It's not, I can't help it. That's their culture. So there's just no interest. That's it. Yeah. Well, I can tell you, I probably between, close probably about, 
I'm mean, adding the numbers. I've given just about five or ten thousand letters that I've gotten emails now saying thank you. I never even considered this stuff. So somehow for Oh yeah, so here's an example. Yeah, Kim. Anthony Flew, whom you won't know, but if you're British and you study philosophy up to ten up to ten years ago, was the most famous philosopher, philosopher atheist in the world. In the nineteen fifties, which seems like the dark ages, but it wasn't. In the nineteen fifties, Anthony Flew wrote a, a, a an uh, essay proving that there could not be a God. Proving, see, but then, see, there's a difference though here, the, uh, uh, because, because he was interested in this stuff. He wrote an essay proving there could not be a God. That essay, when you do a, when, you, when you're gonna find out when you get into, prof into a profession, and you write a paper, and you, and you come home, your wife gives you a hug, and maybe you get tenure, but the paper means nothing if people don't quote it. That's the key. You will understand that if you get into a profession, room, no matter what it is, and you have to publish, publish or perish. If people don't quote, if people don't cite your paper as important, it's, it has essentially no significance except it makes you feel good or maybe you got tenure. Anthony Fu's paper on the proof that there could not be a God for 50 years, five zero years, was the most widely quoted paper in every, in every and any field of philosophy. It was the most widely quoted paper in every, in all fields of philosophy together. It's phenomenal. You never get a paper like Einstein's papers didn't get that kind of review. And then he, he, uh, it's, it's, it's embarrassing to say it, but he, uh, I didn't realize it, but we were gotten together, a very wonderful man by the name of Roy Varghese, he's a, uh, a Asian Indian who lives in America in high tech, and he brought, he gave through my book, and he wrote, and it's kind of book that he wrote also, and he took us together and we got in, in NY, what's the one down, down in Manhattan is New York, NYU, uh, probably NYU. In any event, they have a big film studio there and we filmed, it's available, it's called, uh, has God, has science discovered God. And he, uh, said, I erred. He said that he erred and he apologized on television in print in an essay published in, in, in something at the New York Times and in a book that he wrote called There Is No God and that No is crossed out and above it should A, there is a God. And he apologized for having led hundreds of thousands of people astray for 50 years proving to them that there could not be a God but he didn't know any of the data. He didn't know any of the data, the science data, that's not, not the big formulas, just the, the logical data that stand behind creation. And he, he did, <coughs> the New York Times, or from the States, you know, the New York Times Sunday Magazine is the most important of all the new, new magazines. They had a big nine page article on it, made the front, it on the front, on the front cover of, of Flu's Change. Now, he was accused, as I was accused, he was accused of having been duped by this Jewish theological scientist named Gerald Schroeder, because of the words, duped by this, this Orthodox Jewish scientist, Gerald Schroeder, but poor Anthony Flew was led astray. But Flew said, I follow the school of Socrates. I go to where the truth leads me. And most people don't. Most people turn off. The more of the challenge, they turn off. So they're just not interested. But thank you, I wouldn't, I don't even, but it sounds self-serving, but it, it was pretty amazing. Say so everyone can hear you. <coughs> the 900 billion is what comes out of the relationship of the, it's, it's not linear, so it's not one divided by the other, but there's that equation that was on the board. You can, if you go to my website, I keep, yeah, okay. So that equation, that equation, it's an integral, when you integrate over the six days of it, it wouldn't matter, matter, once you go past the first few days, adding extra days doesn't make a much big difference. It's only a tiny fraction of a percent. But that is, that 900 billion is the, essentially the averaged out number that comes from the equation. Okay? So, so it, it, it tells you, the key of that equation is A0, you know, the constant. That's the key. That's A, that's the ratio of A and B. And then the rest of it, the rest of that equation, operates on that A0. And, well, <coughs> A, A and, the A, the A, and, the A, and, the A and the B, it doesn't, 
it's, it, I don't like saying it's 900 billion because it's, it's processed through that equation. When you run that equation, you integrate from zero to six days or zero to five days. By the time you get past five days, each day's increment is so small because the major, major time is in the early days, but you get this nine, the 900 billion is what comes out. It's a ratio. Oh, it's a ratio of how, how much time will be compressed from this view, us looking back to the Torah, same time from the beginning. So our, there were dinosaurs. Okay? There were dinosaurs, and they disappeared billions, 65 million years ago, and they appear about 320 billion years ago, and their Earth first light 3.6 billion years ago. It's a, those years went by. How would they be perceived from a perspective of time that is completely not human? The Bible's perspective of time is the biblical perspective of time, seeing time from the beginning, looking forward. It is completely not our perspective of time. But it does claim there are six days. And all the major commentators say those days are 24 hours each. Because if they weren't 24 hours, the Torah wouldn't have said day. It would have said tkufa, ona, moa. There are three words right there in Hebrew that tell you indefinite periods of time. But the Torah says yom because it means yom. It doesn't mean sunrise, sunset. Because the sun's not mentioned until the fourth day. But it does mean you're into 24 hours. And that's why both Rashi and the Ramban don't say sunrise. And they say, you know, kaf dalet shoot. So the guy next to you, you had, you had the next one. Who had a question at the end? Yeah? Say it again. Yeah? Well, all of, the, all of that account takes more or less in Mesopotamia. Adam, et cetera, all, that's, all those... Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, is called, that's all the area. Hmm? Say it again? Say what? You just mean the, the, the land of Israel? Why is it? It seems, where does it come from? It comes from God, I would guess. And you know what? The United Nations confirms it every day. There are more resolutions about this little piece of land Trump finally said it. This tiny, look what they've done with this tiny speck of land. Finally, an American president is willing to say something positive. What, have you ever heard that speech of his? What they've done with this tiny speck of land? He was really, you know, as a, as a, as a business developer, he was really impressed. He was really impressed by it. So why is it? It can't, apparently the Torah 35, let this sink in, 3,500 years ago, the Torah makes a claim. That there's little people, a bunch of Shlemiel, Shlemiel slaves that just came out, couldn't even get themselves out by themselves, and they couldn't. It took God to get us out. And, and, a, and a, a Gentile with whom I work finally made it clear to me. I always and they read, I read the text. You know, they're so afraid of the Jews. Why don't they kick them out? The Hebrews, they weren't Jews. Why don't they kick them out? And then this, this person with whom I work from Brazil, we do Skyping hours each week, said, you know why? And she did a calculation. At the minimum wage of a person, they were worth billions of dollars. That's why they didn't want to get rid of them. You know, in the whole text is, if we have a war, they're going to come and get us. So why didn't they let them leave? They didn't let them leave because there was money in their pocket. Slavery was very effective, and only in the United States it got rid of it. when machines made it cheaper than having slaves. Before that time, there were slaves because it's big business. And if you look at the numbers... Of Jews, and just to, to, it's a wonderful calculation. Minimum wage today, can you scale it? You know, minimum wage today divided by two, and and you realize that you're, of course you you know you're working 24 seven, but just give it like the average weekly wage. Okay? Do it for, for whatever the numbers of persons you want to have, six hundred thousand, whatever they are, maybe they won't. You come to billions of dollars. So, and the Torah makes this claim. When we're a bunch of little, uh, you know, just on, on Sinai, we just let it sink in. What we say about us now on Nobel Prizes, etc., etc., that's wonderful. But go back 3,500 years to Sinai. And we're nothing. A bunch of people about to get, and the Torah makes these claims. And guess what? It came to pass. The state of Israel is the biggest thing that's happened to God since Moses came down from Sinai. But beyond, but beyond that, even the Middle Ages, read Gentiles' discussions. A, a, a phenomenal book, he's buried here in Jerusalem. Uh, Jews in the Middle Ages by Parks, William Parks, he's a, he's a pastor. 
that book is this much text and this much references on each page. He said, he brings down the fact that in the Middle Ages, even when Jews were being persecuted, the biggest gift, gift that one feudal lord, this sticks in my head so clearly, you know, there were little, little fiefdoms, people had a castle, it was like his little castle, you know, little country, there weren't big countries. Every fiefdom, the biggest one, if he wanted to make friends with this guy, what's the biggest gift that he could give this next, the next castle over to make sure they stayed friends? What would you guess the biggest gift they did with? Huh? A Jewish, fa a Jewish family. Let's say, a Jewish family. A Jewish family. Why? Because they always knew. One thing they may say, they may hate us, they may not hate us, but they never called us dumb. They never called us dumb.